Well, good morning, everyone around the world. My name is David Granite, and I am coming to you live from the southwest corner of the United States of America. And you are joining the WSPOS Season 2, Episode 3, How to Teach Strabismus Reoperations. This is going to be an incredible session where we're going to take you from the patient that you see in your office through to preoperative planning into the operating room and out of the operating room, including setting expectations. With us today, we have five world's experts. And with me today, we have my co-moderator, Max Serafino, who I will be introducing formally in just a moment. So where are you around the world today? Because I need to not just say good morning, but good afternoon and good evening, because we are live globally. And for that, I'd like to show you a welcome slide, which you're going to see in just a second, and welcome all of you from literally around the world. We will have audience questions that are coming to us live from Facebook and YouTube, where our scientific bureau and our connectivity bureau are with you. Leading those discussions will be Ramesh Technoya and Ken Nischel between those two platforms, Stay involved, ask your questions, they will get passed on to us. If we don't get to your questions, they will be answered, and they will be answered in a PDF that will appear on the WSPOS website. We will answer all of them, they just may not be fully live when we get there. We will also be using Mentimeter today. That's a questions that we'll be asking you and asking you to participate with us. It is the value of being with us live. So on the Mentimeter, you go to menti.com and you put in the passcode 1453599. That's 1453599. Or you can also scan this QR code to connect. Please answer those questions as they appear. I'll be running through them as we go throughout the, the uh, morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are. So those questions will help us interact with you and know where you stand. There will also be audience participation certificates that will be available as well. So those you get by emailing uh, to the program at WSPOS.org. Um, uh, this is unbelievably the globe. And this globe, which I think everyone can see, if I hit it right, will show us the entire world that we're talking to. So I want you to understand that today we'll be speaking in English, but we have people from not just North America, Central America, South America, Europe, Asia, the Middle East, Africa, Australia, but also in Singapore and in Hong Kong and all over the globe. So we will try and make sure we speak in such a way that everyone can join with us. This is so important that you're here with us. Here are the upcoming webinars for season two. These are all the, mess the, the webinars that you'll have a chance to participate in, including wide field imaging, mm -hmm. ocular surface disease, Next week, or two weeks from now, our next session, we botulinum toxin, uh, or pivocane use in strabismus. And joining us, we will have a world-class panel. You are still able to register for WWW Connect, the 24-hour session that took you from around the globe. You will, if you register and join us in the new year, get a book from Carger. This is a book which is edited by uh, Dr. Ken Nischel and has authors from around the world. That comes to you free with your registration at WWW Connect. It's 95 euros for pediatric ophthalmologists, 70 euros for trainees. It's an unbelievable value for your dollar to have, uh, I think it was 16 or 15, 14 scientific sessions, sorry, uh, three keynote sessions, one best of the best, that's 18 sessions. Uh, we had a joint session with ESCRS. It goes on and on. You have abstracts. Uh, it's just an amazing session that you get for an incredible value. As I said, the audience questions will be taken up. And let me correct the, the make sure we have the correct mentee code, 1453599. That's 1453599. Uh, 
uh, and you'll be able to scan through those. So enough of the business of what we want you to take care of. My, my first pleasure today is going to be to introduce Max Arfino, my co-moderator and a brilliant ophthalmologist from Italy, where he heads up the Children's Hospital in Genoa. He is uh, running, helping running and teaching residency in Milan. He's been doing research in the field of strabismus and pediatric cataract. We have worked together on several projects, including Adelphi, which is where you try and get expert opinion when you don't have the answers, specifically on what is success in strabismus. And believe it or not, it was hard to get an answer. So I'm going to turn over this meeting right now to my co-moderator and an outstanding ophthalmologist and a friend, Max Serafino, to introduce the rest of our panel. Max? Thank you, David. Thank you and welcome, everyone. Thank you for your introduction. And let me uh, introduce the other speakers. So first, my good friend, David Granite, is the Vice Chair of Ophthalmology and the professors at uh, and rather chair of ophthalmology and pediatrics uh, at rather Ratner Children's Eye Centers in San Diego, California, at Charlie Eye Institute. He's a great husband, great dad, great friend. He, together with Ken Nichol, they changed the way to communicate among ophthalmologists. As Zuckerberg changed the way to communicate among people, they changed the way to communicate among ophthalmologists around the world. So thank you, David. Thank you, Ken to this. And Daisy, she's a great orthopsis, chief orthopsis in Antwerp in Belgium at the University Hospital. She's a, an orthopsis teaching volunteer in Congo, Rwanda, Nigeria, and India. Jyoti Mataglia, she's a great ophthalmologist, head of pediatric ophthalmology, strabismology at neuroophthalmology in India and Bangalore is in charge postgraduate program and pediatric ophthalmology fellowship program at NN2. She's an invited faculty at the national and international conferences and teaching is her passion. So thank you, Jyoti. Well, my good friend Mauro Dodgman from Brazil is a director and founder of Strabos Institute and the professor of ophthalmology, head of Strabismo section, Chema Hospital, is a great grandfather actually. And my great friend Federico is a tenured professor at the Division of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus Department of Ophthalmology at Duke Eye Center in North Carolina, medical editor, newsletter, and World Society of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus. He's an associate editor and chair of the Adult Strabismus Comedy for APOS and presented over 400 lectures national and international, including five named lectures. 33 guest keynote lectures, over 250 scientific publications, is amazing. And Kali, she's a, um, an amazing orthoptist in the United States. She uh, is a, a program director of Rosales Institute Orthoptic Fellowship Program. She's an assistant professor at the Department of Ophthalmology in Buffalo editor-in-chief for the Journal of Binocular Vision and Ocular Modality. So I think we can start, right, David? Oh, yes. And, and okay. while Kyle uh, and Daisy are getting ready their talks, I have to mention that we now have people joining us from, ready for this, Japan, Sweden, Argentina, India, Indonesia, France, Italy, South Africa, Kenya, Nigeria, Ecuador, Mexico, Australia, Israel, Lebanon, Canada, Spain, Iraq, Myanmar, Greece, Romania, Slovakia, let's see, uh, Saudi Arabia, Brazil, Russia, Turkey. The world is listening. And the platform is yours, Kyle. Thank you. When it comes to the examination of a reoperation, everything you heard two weeks ago, the previous um, uh, with post uh, webinar on teaching strabismus surgery, all of that still applies. But for a reoperation, there are a few added layers of complexity. Today I'm going to share with you my approach to a reoperation, uh, specifically answering questions uh, that 
sharing with you the questions I want to answer and what it is that I'm looking for on my examination. The first thing I ask myself is, how did we get here? Why is reoperation being considered at all? When was the previous surgery and what was done? How did the outcome go wrong? And what is the patient's attitude towards the surgery now? Because it can change between an initial surgery and a follow-up surgery. So let's look at each of those individually. Why the operation? Well, very often this comes down to a cosmetic concern. But we need to be aware that it may not just be the eye position, but it could be something about the lid position or even the conjunctiva. It may be something functional. It may be something unknown. This is something many of my patients will tell me. I don't know exactly what is wrong, but my eyes aren't looking right. This is a patient that I'm going to spend a lot of time with to determine exactly what their complaint is. And then some patients, of course, will say, well, yes, all of the above. We may have the records from the previous surgery, but sometimes we don't. And it's wise to collect as much information preoperatively as possible. So we might look for surgical scars over the rectus muscles, maybe do an OCT or other imaging to try to find the location of previously operated muscles. Even the sensory exam can help us determine the history of an evolution of this strabismus. So how did the outcome go so wrong? Well, it may be that we were misled by the initial preoperative sensory exam. It may be that the motor exam was incomplete. Or maybe nothing went wrong, and this is a normal postoperative drift that occurred over time. When it comes to the sensory exam, I think one of the biggest problems is that the tests that were used preoperatively didn't really relate to the patient. In the United States, the two most common sensory tests that are done are the titmus test and prism offset of the deviation. At best, these tests will give us irrelevant information. But at worst, especially in the case of prism offset, they may mislead us. The sensory exam often can be incomplete. When I'm doing my sensory exam, I'm trying to answer three questions. What is the likelihood of restoration or improvement in fusion? What is the risk of bothersome postoperative diplopia? And what is the prognosis for long-term correction? To answer those questions, I'm going to look at fusion ranges in multiple directions. And I'm going to do this regardless of the patient's control. We always think of checking mode of fusion with intermittent deviations. But constant deviations may surprise you they may have some fusion reserves. I'm also going to look for the depth and the size of the suppression scotoma, because this is going to affect the long-term prognosis. And most importantly, I want to identify the target range for alignment and the obstacles to fusion. Exactly what do we have to correct with this surgery in order to make the patient happy? There are some pitfalls on the motor examination as well. Sometimes we underestimate the deviation, and this usually is because of uh, poor measurement technique. It is the corresponding points in our peripheral field that have the greatest impact on our motor fusion. So when we're measuring strabismus, we have to ensure that we are completely occluding the peripheral field. Maybe it's a failure to detect severity of incompetence. And this happens when we don't measure the patient fully into the secondary or tertiary position of gaze. What I do here is rotate the patient's head as far as they can go. I double check that they can see the target with each eye. And then I begin my cover testing. Failure to check tertiary positions. This can be important even in what appears to be a purely horizontal deviation. It doesn't mean that we have to do a prism and alternate cover test there. Sometimes we do. But we have to look. Incomplete investigation of muscle function. 
If I find a limitation on versions, I'm going to investigate it. I'm going to double check with ductions. And I'm also going to do psychotic velocities, just at chair side, not with any special equipment. We might miss a superimposed cyclotropia. We all know to look for a cyclotropia when we have a suspected superior oblique palsy. But we should be looking every time we have a vertical deviation, with the possible exception of DVD. And finally, neglecting to consider the effects of high refractive error, patients with high plus or high minus lenses in glasses can offer, uh, can produce misleading results on a cover test because of the prismatic effect of these high lenses. We may over or underestimate the deviation. As far as accommodation in the ACA, we always think to look for that when we have a child with an esotropia. But these two things, the ACA and accommodation, also play a role in exodeviations and also in adults with horizontal strabismus. Sometimes the postoperative drift is actually normal and even expected because we found that large dense suppression scotoma prior to the first surgery. I told my patients that the younger you were when your strabismus had its onset, the more likely it is that you're going to need at least one reoperation at some point in your life. And this is because of the long term effects of poor fusion and adaptations. The body would perceive strabismus surgery as an injury and will attempt to repair the injury. So in a sense, we are working against these natural processes and we should never be surprised when strabismus reoccurs. Finally, the patient's attitude is very important. It's going to be different for a reoperation than for the initial procedure. If there was a misunderstanding at the preoperative examination of the original surgery, uh, the patient may be presenting now with anger, maybe disappointment, and maybe even discouragement and a loss of faith in the process. Even if the outcome of the reoperation is pretty good, the patient may still be unhappy. So our goal is to collaborate. The orthoptist and the surgeon work together to form the best picture of this patient for the reoperation. We need to ensure communication, make sure that we really understand what the patient is trying to tell us, and that the patient understands what we're trying to say. Make sure we define what we would consider a success to be, and come to sort of some sort of consensus as to what we would accept if things aren't 100% perfect, and what we're looking to achieve. And this is really the best road to surgical success. Thank you. Wow. Um, Kyle, I, I think that that is um, already a classic talk. I mean, you gave it like three seconds ago, and I think it's a classic talk. That was incredible. And I'm, I'm going to insist that my residents and fellows already watched that. Um, you know, it's funny. Uh, while I was listening to you, so many things went through my mind because it was brilliant. Um, you should know that we have people from uh, the, my family in the Philippines, Turkey, Peru, uh, Quebec, Cyprus, Kazakhstan, Norway, the UK, everybody's here. All right. So um, the, the, we always say in our center is that fusion is your friend and accommodation is king and you ignore the king at your own risk. So that's the way we sort of talk about it. Um, and then the other thing I thought about when you were talking about setting expectations is that um, I always walk in and say, how you doing? Because although I may not be thrilled, the patient might be. And we have a rule of thumb is we never talk a patient out of a good result. So if they're happy, we don't talk them out of being happy uh, around here. And then the, the, the question I have for you is we did a, a project, I did this with uh, Rick Ventura from the Philippines years ago, where we actually went to uh, the American pediatric ophthalmology meetings and we had over 80 pediatric ophthalmologists and orthopedists measure me. And we saw what position they put my head in. And especially for, uh, for incompetent gaze, the variability was enormous from 10 degrees to 50 degrees. And so if there's an incompetent hypertropia on left gaze and it gets worse as you look further over, 
and I measure at 10 degrees and you measure at 50 degrees, we're going to think we have two different problems and may, may actually want to uh, use two different interventions. And if you read my article, you're going to say, Granite doesn't know what he's doing. I tried it. It didn't work. So how do we make sure that we're measuring in a consistent way, not just amongst ourse ourselves each time we measure the patient, but among different people so that the literature makes sense from person to person? Yes. You know, I remember that study. I remember the APOS meeting where you did that. And I think I participated. <laughs> um, <laughs> that, you know, the easiest answer to that is if you have a Hess green or Lancaster red green, um, and it's in a fixed position, so you're always going to be repeating uh, uh, the measurements at the same distance, um, this would be the most repeatable. But if you don't have something like that, um, then this is what I do. I'm going to, and, and even this is not going to be consistent from patient to patient, but it might be consistent with consecutive exams on the same patient, so because it's, it relies on neck mobility. Um, I'm always going to move the head as far as we can go, make sure that the patient can fix it with either eye before I start my measurements. And when I'm doing the tertiary positions, I will go into a secondary position first and then a tertiary position. At least this way, I know that I'm always measuring the same spot. But it doesn't, and I teach this to my students and to our residents. Um, we all need to get on the same page. If we're going to be working as an orthoptist, if I'm going to be working with a different surgeon on different patients, I want to make sure that they know what I'm doing so that they can realistically compare their measurements to mine. But, you know, this is an excellent point. I think um, unless you have some sort of device where we used to have one of these at Wilmer, it was converted from an old arc printer where you have a chin rest and a forehead rest and the patient doesn't move head but the eyes to these various gaze positions. Then you really know that you're, you're remeasuring in the same spot. But unless you have something like that, it's still going to be an estimate. Yeah, and a follow-up to this is when I presented that, uh, Gunther von Norden came to me and said he presented the same things 40 years earlier. Um, and this is now 20 years ago, so that's 60 years ago, raising the same issue. And even before that, in the 1950s, Goodwin Brynan did the EMG studies to help guide us in terms of where we should even be looking in these fields, these positions of gaze. And of the 88 people that we tested, one, one person tested in, in, in uh, every position of gaze was at 30 degrees which we're not even sure if that's the perfect gaze. And that was George Ellis from the United States. I should give him credit. But no one else got every person the same. And the most common techniques that we used were they used my glasses for the extent of my vertical uh, uh, movements was the glasses. Very few people moved my glasses up and down wow. as I moved my head. And they used my nose for side gaze. Now, I have a big nose. So obviously, my side gaze is going to be different than someone else's. So I find this fascinating. And uh, as we compare data from one surgeon to the other, and we, especially when we talk about reops, Max, did you want to bring up anything else? No, thanks. Um, to me, it's very important to, to give some suggestion to help people doing the same things. But I know that's different. So I just want to know if using 30 degrees uh, for lateral gaze and 25 degrees for vertical gaze should be a good angle uh, that can be used from everyone for every, I mean, uh, during our practice. Just to give a suggestion to people. Could be 30 degrees and 25 degrees as a good, uh, you know, gaze for measuring yes. distance. <clears throat> yes. Yeah. And, you know, the, uh, uh, Kyle, sorry, I'm going to jump in. The work that um, Brian did on EMGs so the, the antagonist muscle turned off after about 25 degrees, and he suggested 30 degrees was a physiologic good spot to measure in with a rationale. Von Norden built a deviometer, which Kyle referred to Wilmer, where you would sit in a slit lamp with your head fixed, and, and you would look in different positions of gaze, and he set that at 25 degrees. I think I'm measuring more at 25 degrees, usually. You know, these measurements can also be taken on as an op before because you can move the arms and then you know 
at what degree you are measuring. Uh, but personally, I find that awkward. And the synop before, um, the measurements that you get with that are not always equivalent to what you measure with the gold standard, the prism and alternate cover in free space. David? If you use the Hess Lancaster a screen, will you actually be more precise on every patient that you're measuring? Because the head is still, the gazes are always fixed. So then we're going to be looking into a more precise measurement. Right. So you're always going to be measuring in the same position. The problem with the Lancaster and Hess screen is they may not fully dissociate the patient. Um, and you can't really effectively use that on um, someone with suppression. Terrific. Uh, so, let's uh, uh, it, keep this uh, rolling because this discussion is so good um, and get uh, Daisy to bring up her slides. And while she does, Mara, did you have a comment you wanted to make? Just to say that uh, I teach my residents and fellow to measure in space, uh, turning the head the maximum possible. We don't know how much is 25 or 30 or 35 degrees of turning or uh, putting the chin up or down. So I just say, go to the maximum you can and measure it. You're on, Daisy. Your mic is on and you're, we're ready for your slides. So, Mara, while Daisy's pulling up her slides, um, uh, the problem with that is when you compare yeah. one surgeon to another. And if we're not all doing the same technique, your data and my data won't match. Okay, I understand. But uh, right. so if you do the maximum yeah. and I do the maximum, this is, uh, this is uh, what is done. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yes, yeah. but if, uh, if, if my patient turns 15 degrees because they have a neck problem or they have a large nose and your patient turned 30 and you publish mm -hmm. your inferior uh, oblique results and I try it and I get them at a different place, we have a different result. So, well, Daisy, are you ready? In... Wait. Wait. Uh, yeah, Daisy, is my screen on? on? Yes. No, we yes. see you, Daisy. Mine... So um, we can, we can skip that and uh, go on if Daisy's unable to get her slides up. Do you see it now? Yes, ma'am. Yes, yeah. ma'am. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. I will now uh, present some practical pearls before reoperations. So my first pearl is evaluate lateral incompetence. So if you have a residual isotropia, it is important to look at lateral side to see if the uh, isotropia is the same or larger or smaller. In this case, you see the isotropia is smaller on lateral side, which means that probably there has been a recession of one or both medial rectus muscles. So additional recession of a medial rectus muscle will give you an overcorrection or even a limitation of adduction and additional surgery on this isotropia may result in a consecutive exotropia afterward. On the other hand, when the isotropia is equal or larger in lateral gaze, you still can do recession on the medial rectus muscles. And what's important too is to look to upshoots and downshoots in adduction. In this case, you see upshoot in adduction. We also see overaction of the inferior oblique muscle and a V pattern. So in these patients, we should also do surgery probably on the inferior oblique muscles. In case of consecutive exotropia, again, it is important to look at lateral side. And you see that here the exotropia is larger in lateral gaze because of a limitation of adduction larger on the left than on the right eye. And what we also see is overaction uh, of the inferior oblique muscles and a large V pattern. So in this case, advancement or resection of the medial rectus muscle is probably necessary 
and also in uh, its surgery on the inferior oblique muscle. If we see patients with residual DVD, it is important to evaluate the hypertrophy and lateral gaze fixating with the right and the left eye. If the hypertrophy is larger in adduction, fixating with the abducting eye, then probably you will also find a V pattern and the inferior oblique muscles should be operated. On the other hand, when the hypertropia is larger in abduction, when the adducting eye is fixating, you will find an A pattern and the superior rectus muscles are the cause of your DVD. Then my second pearl is do a prism adaptation test in case of a residual intermittent exotropia, as in this girl who has still a considerable exotropia, especially at distance fixation. At near, she can compensate. She has fusion at near and even stereopsis. At distance, she has a manifest exotropia with suppression. So if we do the prism adaptation test, we correct her uh, both eyes with a prism of 20 prism diopters. She has to wait in the waiting room at least one hour, when we see her back, we see that the deviation is increased with 10 prism diopters. We correct the prism diopters again, so 20 prism diopters, and she goes to the waiting room again. After 20, 60 minutes, there is no increasement anymore, so we stop the prism adaptation test, and when there is no diplopia, the operation can be done on the angle after the prism adaptation test. My third pearl is measure the deviation in primary position, fixating with the right and the left eye, especially in residual paralytic strabismus. When you fixate with the right eye, the prism should be held before the left eye to measure the deviation of the left eye. Then you fix, the patient has to fixate with the left eye hold the prism in front of the right eye, and you measure the deviation of the left eye, which is larger. So we have here the difference between the secondary and the, and the, the primary and the secondary deviation. This is important because if you operate, you need to see the difference. An even better way to measure it is with a synoptophore, because there you can put the arm of the synoptophore at zero degrees, so you know that it's fixating in primary position, and then you measure the deviation of the left eye. Then you put the arm, the left arm on zero degrees, fixating with the left eye, and you me measure the deviation of the right eye. And you see again, you see a large difference. If you have patients who cannot fixate in primary position, then you have to note to, to, to point out at what, what degree you have measured your deviation. My fourth pearl is always record ocular motility with has or Lancaster screen, especially in residual consecutive paralytic or mechanical strabismus. And if you're looking for horizontal deviation, put your lines vertical. If you're looking for a vertical deviation, put them horizontal, and it's also very useful to measure your torsional deviation. I prefer the Lancaster for that. If you don't have a Lancaster, you can use a HES or a Lee screen. And here you see how useful it is. So before the operation, you see overaction of the both medial rectus muscles, and uh, you have a hypertropia of the left eye. So surgery was done. Two weeks after the operation, you still see overaction here. And two months, you see that the overaction is less, but still operation can be done on the medial rectus here and the inferior oblique there. This is a Lancaster patient with paralytic strabismus. You see before the operation and after the operation, the isotropia is better. 
you still see a large a limitation of abduction, but here you see now also a limitation of adduction, which you should take in account for planning your search and your following surgery. The fifth pearl is in case you have patients uh, with nystagmus, poor fixations, or unclear diplopia or complaints, look for small or hidden deviations with your Maddox rod and use it in all directions of case. It can help you to find very small vertical deviations which you cannot see when doing your clinical examination. And my last pearl is look for binocular single vision or find the suppression scotoma in patients with residual or consecutive strabismus with diplopia. You will first have to correct the deviation with prisms till the patient has single vision. And from that point, you can measure the fusion range or the suppression scotoma in horizontal or in vertical uh, direction. If you don't find fusion, think about possibly there is cyclotorsion or there can even be anisoconia. Thank you. Well, thank you, Daisy. It's a terrific presentation. Thank you very, very much. So now we should move on. And but before uh, um, before that, I want to ask David Granite if uh, he can show us show show the world actually is a pre-operative planning sheet he used. I use that sheet. I love that sheet. I used to hang up that sheet on the microscope because I, I, I operate with the microscope. So thank you, David. <laughs> well, th thanks, Max. Um, this is uh, something that we published that came out of uh, conversations with my fellows, our teaching sessions, as we discussed especially reoperations. And since our topic is teaching reoperations, um, I really appreciate you asking. Uh, that we published. And basically, um, the idea started with uh, something I learned from Marshall Parks, who put up his plan uh, the day I visited him for my interview. You never know what you'll learn from each of the doctors you meet. And in our preoperative planning sheet, we have our sensory motor test. We have an area to draw where the previous surgery was. We have the examination. And uh, if you don't think the sensory motor test is key, then you weren't listening to both Kyle and Daisy. They just did um, an incredible uh, conversation about why an orthoptist is so important. And uh, I work with an orthoptist, Erica Sarah, who's spectacular. Learn from an orthoptist. It's really crucial. So this is what we mean by drawing. And uh, every surgery that we've come up with so far has a drawing. You can see an interoblique myectomy. Uh, this is what an F would be a fixating eye, an amblyopic eye, a pseudophagic eye. We uh, have ways of showing a resection by putting an X there or plication by showing the muscle folded here. Um, we have uh, all different ways to show it. Let me show you what it comes down to. For example, if this is a patient and I tried to tell you what they had in words, and if you closed your eyes and tried to get the entire picture, it would be, I would say, almost impossible. So it's a patient after bilateral orbital decompression by the dots, glaucoma surgery with a filter on the left, a drainage device on the right, Pre, uh, post cataract surgery and LASIK and who has had a medial rectus recession with an offset uh, and a posterior fixation of the inferior rectus on the right and Botox three times in the left. So, I mean, in one picture, you see all of it. And since strabismus is so visual, it's an opportunity to see that. So we draw that and we put our plan back on that planning sheet that we talked about that also has the surgical plan so you don't have to do much thinking as you're in the operating room. So that's our, uh, our preoperative planning sheet. And whatever you do, something like that is very helpful, uh, especially in such a visual field. Thanks for asking, Max. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. Uh, I think uh, your sheet should be very, very, very interesting and good and useful for everyone in the world. So um, let's move on and uh, uh, Jody, Mauro, Federico, thank you for your hard work and it's all yours. All right. Oh. 
Okay, hello everyone in the world. I'm uh, Mauro Goldschmidt, speaking from Sao Paulo, Brazil. And uh, the mission here is uh, to speak on how we teach strabismus reoperations. Uh, Federico, Jody, and myself, uh, we three worked together in the past uh, week to bring together one uh, single presentation, and the three of us will be uh, speaking on the following slides. Uh, Jody and I, we have no disclosure. So, some initial philosophy. Uh, I want to say that uh, strabismus reoperation for me is one of the most complex and challenging procedures in ophthalmology. And when we start teaching uh, uh, strabismus surgery, there is a way of confidence that the resident and fellows they, they get. And when they come to reoperation, there is a no end learning curve. So we start with five key points that will help us go through this entire presentation, starting with history and examination, then pre-operative planning and decision making, important tests and imaging, then intra-op evaluation, specific instrumentation and surgical steps, and finally post-operative advice and miscellaneous aspects that will be discussed. Starting with pre-operative assessment, as Kyle has already mentioned, all photographs very, very important. Like this child is now an adult, came with the same face turn, same squint in the left eye. And if you can see his photograph when he was a child, indicating that there was a residual squint. But luckily, we had the surgical notes. He was operated for a left eye DRS surgery, and you can see the lateral rectus Y split. And if you did not have this, you would have gone in and cause a disaster. So this time, these things do help because the Y split of the two while surgery, while you're performing surgery can come in the way. So it's important to have your surgical notes. And I also tell my, my residents and fellows, uh, have you answered the following questions? Do you know what was the previous deviation? So this is a child that came two weeks after surgery for an isotropia and she had a slipped muscle. Then the other question that comes is, uh, do we have the reports and the results from previous surgery? It means uh, you, uh, the patient was operated, he, was, uh, he had the eyes aligned, and uh, many years later, uh, he became uh, uh, with a new type of strabismus, or did it start right away? And finally, we have to check for conjunctival and scleroscars, as uh, uh, Kyle and uh, Daisy pointed. One of the most important points for me is to evaluate the ocular rotations. Uh, however, just ocular rotations cannot determine what we need to do intraoperatively. Like you see here, a limitation to a deduction can result from a over recessed medial rectus slip muscle or maybe a very tight lateral rectus muscle. It is important while examining the patient to check uh, not only limitation, but the saccadic velocity that will tell us uh, how strong or how is uh, innervated uh, the muscle is. And if you find a limitation of, for example, in this case, of abduction of the right eye, uh, you can order an image and you will check, you'll see the slipped muscle. Along with the imaging studies, if you're reoperating an adult patient that you're concerned with anterior segment ischemia, obtaining a preoperative um, fluorescent angiogram or ICG of the anterior segment may be very important, especially when you are operating in multiple muscles in the same eye. Federico, can you go back to that? I'm sorry, because I think yes. this is really important. Can you talk yeah. about what we're seeing and how you do that? Sure, thank you. So I'm gonna stop here a video and then I run the video. So um, what we're seeing here is an iris angiogram. Um, we use two different techniques. I use fluorescein angiograms in a patients who have a clear irises. But when you have dark color iris like mine, for example, a fluorescein angiogram would be just like what you're seeing here. Basically, you will not see much. So it's better to use an ICG. And what would you see, this is a short video, um, but excuse me, yeah, it's running. 
And it's a little bit pixelated there, but you, I'm gonna stop the video right here. So right there, these are actually just conjunctival blood vessels from previous surgeries and multiple surgeries this patient had. But this patient actually had a lost medial rectus muscle and a lost inferior rectus muscle from a um, traumatic um, endoscopic sinus surgery. And what you only see is the irrigation coming from the superior rectus muscle. So this patient has really a significant amount of ischemia. How do we obtain this? I always teach that you have to start taking pictures as early as the first second post the injection. So it's better to tell your technician to start recording images right before they start the injection. So you get from the second one and you take late images as well. But the most relevant will be probably on the first 30 to 60 seconds, because then that's what is going to really show you the arterial filling of the anterior, I mean, of the iris, excuse me. I use it really not frequently, but it's better to have it when you're planning surgeries, again, in patients with risk of anterior segment ischemia in whom you're going to do even one muscle, because if something happens, at least you have an answer that you're seeing a postoperative severe inflammation, not necessarily from a UBI it is different than anterior segment ischemia. Uh, it, we've used this sometimes to show a patient why it's dangerous to cut more muscles in that eye and go to the other eye that may be untouched. Great, great point. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, Thanks wanna... for explaining that, Federico. Thank you, Dave. Okay. So there are some, of course, general principles that uh, we have to keep in mind. Uh, we have to have good uh, surgical instruments for reoperations, and uh, of course, this groove uh, um, hook that uh, there are several uh, uh, examples. And uh, I like this uh, retractor that was made here in Brazil. Um, they have in, in uh, each side different length, and uh, it's uh, soft that you can move it and insert into the globe and, of course, a good assistant. Uh, concepts on surgical plan, uh, reoperation, there are no, no two patients that are equal. They should be evaluated individually. And it, this is essential. Uh, uh, we have to have a careful preoperative examination and get the best diagnosis. I'd like to show this uh, flow chart from Burton Kushner where according to the limitation of rotation, he will uh, uh, decide on operating previously operated muscles or according to over or under correction and incompetence, presence or no, not in, of incompetence, or if you have done prior uh, maximum surgery, surgery or not, then he, he will decide, uh, we will decide which muscle we, we, we will be reoperating. And now, Jyoti will explain a little bit more about this uh, flow chart. Yes, so I'll be simplifying. So when we are talking about reoperations, we are either managing the overcorrection or the undercorrection. So it could be either in the horizontal deviation or the vertical deviation. In the horizontal deviation, anything more than 12 to 15 prism diopters needs to be corrected. But in the vertical direction, deviation, even a 5 PD can be disturbing and may need to be tucked. Remember, in horizontal deviation, a vertical offset can induce a vertical deviation. Now, sometimes, in those cases, we may need to either operate on the same horizontal uh, surgery if there is a limitation of rotation, but if none, we can go and operate on the vertical muscle. Coming back to the planning, so if you have an undercorrection and overcorrection, we have to look at the ocular motility, the disparity for the deviation at distance and near, and only then we can have the guidelines of operating on either on the already operated muscles or the fresh muscles. Which means if there's an overcorrection, we look for the limitation of rotation and go ahead and operate on the previously operated muscle. But in absence of incompetence, we can go and operate on the fresh muscles. Now, for example, if you're looking at the overcorrections after horizontal squint surgery, if there's a consecutive XT, if there's a near deviation which is more than distance deviation, then we may need to go and explore the MR which may be underacting and may need to advance and resect. However, when there's a consecutive isotropia and we find the distance deviation more than near deviation, 
we have to look and look at LR, explore, advance, and resect. So as previously mentioned, we don't really have any particular formula to follow. What do we get in the clinics and what additionally find on table is what we decide. Now coming to the undercorrection, if we have that and they are maximally recessed muscles, which we talk about medial rectus more than about five to six and lateral rectus more than eight to nine, we operate on fresh muscles. But if the muscles are not recessed maximally, then we can operate on the previously operated muscles. Jyoti, yeah. could you please uh, tell us what you mean for maximally, um, at least for medial rectus and lateral rectus that are the most, um, yes. uh, you know, Right. So as I mentioned, for maximal recession in medial rectus, anything more than five to six millimeters already recessed, we tend to avoid. Otherwise, there will be a consecutive ST developing again. And for lateral rectus, anything more than eight to nine millimeters. Thank you. Yeah. So as we move on, something very, very important is a force duction test. I keep telling my students, you have to do minimum of about 30 not less than 50 constantly for them to actually start understanding how a muscle is normal. And you can do it as a two-hand technique where you're holding at 12 and 6 or a single hand. Similarly, you're doing for the lateral rectus. You're moving the eye passively in the direction of the particular muscle. And this is what we're doing in one hand. So one thing, uh, I think, Federico, you can just show. This is that line which you see, Jampolsky string test, where you find that there's a string-like effect on the conjunctiva. That can actually occur if you are pulling the conjunctiva on already shortened. And that will tell you that the conjunctiva is, re is relatively short in this case. So very important. Now, force duction test, when you look at, have to be done at different, different types. So this is a patient with scarring, as you can see. And you see how tight the muscle is. And then when you recess the conjunctiva and you do the force duction, you see it's still tight. There you go and hook the muscle. And finally, when you've recessed it and you do an FDT, you will see that it's perfectly okay, and then you can leave the muscle here. So what is important is that your FDT has to be done at each level. Before starting the surgery, after conjunctival recession, after releasing the muscle, and reattaching it. Um, I would like to, to add here uh, on the perioperative tests the importance of the eye position and the general anesthesia. Uh, if you operate on a patient who is isotropic, and under uh, general anesthesia, his eyes are aligned. Uh, it means by the end of surgery, you have to have an exotropia. The eyes should be in abduction position. So as you see on the bottom left, uh, the eye position on uh, before surgery and by the end of surgery where we wanted it to be. So force duction test was shown uh, before and uh, repeat the spring back balance forces uh, after each step of surgery. After disinserting the conjunctiva, opening the conjunctiva, disinserting the muscle and closing the conjunctiva. Mauro, uh, yeah? this is David. Um, a question that came up on YouTube was, in preoperative planning, if you don't know what the previous surgery was, do you do any kind of imaging from CAT scan MRI to an OCT or a UBM to identify the locations of these muscles and or to help you do, do your planning? Okay, so first, uh, in, in clinic, if you have a limitation of rotation, very important with low saccade, uh, I think it's important to get uh, an MRI to check where the, eye, the, the muscle is. Uh, the studies uh, on, on OCT uh, shows that we can uh, identify muscle uh, maybe seven millimeters uh, from the insertion. So uh, if the muscle is recessed seven millimeters, uh, it still brings a good um, uh, rotation. So I don't think uh, that OCP is uh, uh, too useful as uh, uh, an MRI. So if there is a, an important restriction of movement, I will uh, order uh, an, an image. And uh, sorry, sorry, Mauro. Um, Mauro also, or Federico maybe also. Um, there is a, a, an amount of deviation in um, prismatic diopters uh, between uh, an awake patient and a patient during general anesthesia. I know that um, ASCO published something about this. 
and Federico is uh, one of his fellow. Yeah, um, I, I personally, I know uh, there's some people, Dominic in France, I think, uh, and Mauro just, just mentioned it. I personally, and be honest with you, don't use the position on the general anesthesia as my final decision on what I do. It's a personal decision. I'm not sure if all patients are equally deeply anesthetized and with the muscles being equally relaxed to be like an accurate um, measurement for me to make that decision. I rely more on the uh, spring back testing and the force duction test and of course the preoperative alignment. But that's, that's a personal uh, opinion about it. Federico, of course that uh, spring back balance forces are uh, important, but it, and it comes before the final position of the eyes. So if you do the spring back and the eye is still turning out on a consecutive uh, exotropia, for example, you should uh, uh, change your plan or uh, change your millimeters in order to end in a, another position. Absolutely. I totally agree with you, but not so much the position under general anesthesia. I believe more on the spring back testing. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, so uh, there are some surgical tips important. Uh, sometimes we face uh, um, very red conjunctiva that should be opened uh, carefully. And um, uh, uh, I prefer a limbo uh, opening the conjunctiva to get a wild surgical field. And uh, when you open the conjunctiva, we will see lots of scars that sh should be cleaned. And uh, this will be shown on the next video. Yeah, so I feel that uh, when you're doing re-operations, initially I usually use loops, but I feel that initial cases can be done under microscope if you're not sure where it is. Now in this video, I'm showing that the eye is moving. I'm trying to explore the scars which are there before I move ahead. Uh, in the second video, what I'm noticing is I'm moving a blunt instrument over to see how loose the conjunctiva is so I know exactly where to go. So normally we would take a phonic incision, but in for the students, I would say uh, taking a limbal incision is much better because then you get a broader uh, exposure and we don't want to cut something which will ever later on repent. Jody? Yes. Jody? Excuse yes, me, did, yes, you, did, you, did, you, did you two quick questions? Uh, did yes. you change uh, your approach uh, on conjunctiva if you are operating on a child or on adult? I mean, conjunctiva is, is different, you know? First question. Right, no, I would not do, I tend to, tend to do phonics, but as I'm teaching, I would prefer to do a limbal incision. Or like the previous case where there was a Y split, I want a broader exposure, so in that I will take a limbal incision. Okay, another quick question that could be interesting for all of us is, uh, do you think there is a difference between loops and microscope? Because I'm, I use microscope, actually. And uh, I mean, I know there are a lot of surgeons that use loops. Uh, this could be a, a good question, I mean, to discuss. Yeah, so I too use loops, but I have noticed that in certain surgeries where I really want to go in the depths, microscope does help. Now, the advantages is that microscope gives you better, you know, identification of structures. And, uh, but in loop, you get a broader field. So you really want to go across, look at different things, then the loop becomes an easier thing. But in India, a lot of places, we tend, most of them tend to use microscope because that's easily available. But I would advise that if you are using a microscope, keep at the least illumination so that you get to get the, the maximum field if possible. Uh, Max, I, I have two, two comments, quick ones. One, I personally prefer to do limbo or paralimbal approach in adults because that conjunctiva does not really stretch and it can be easily turned when you're trying to explore, especially if you have a muscle that you don't even know it is from no previous records. In kids, you can do either way, but I think when you're learning and you're, until you feel really comfortable, and even these days, I feel like having a good approach, as Mauro mentioned, is probably wise uh, when you're doing uh, reoperations. In second, I understand the view with the microscope, but also, for some people, it's very difficult sometimes to approach muscles that have been recessed a significant amount because the curvature of the eye kind of blocks the good view that you can obtain with the microscope. But I understand also that it may be easier 
to put sutures on the sclera when you're using the microscope versus when you're using the loops. It's just also kind of two points over there. Federico, Thank you. Uh, it was not a reoperation, but I had the opportunity to do one surgery with the 3D equipment. And I think that uh, this will, if uh, when possible to be popularized, uh, it will be very nice to operate for business with this 3D equipment. Um, the, what we, the, uh, the, the surgeon view is totally different from what we see. All right. I think it's still too uh, expensive, this. <laughs> I know that. While we're, while we're discussing some of these issues, um, the forced duction question that came up from online, and we're, there's a huge discussion going on online, and we're passing on some of these questions, was um, if the, the speakers would comment on what they instruct their anesthesiologist in terms of muscle relaxants to make sure that the forced ductions and the springback testing are of value to them. So, uh, Mauro, Federico, Joti, do you tell your, your anesthesiologist anything special? I don't. I don't. I no. don't. Uh, the only thing is that I have the same anesthesiologist ever with me, and um, they know what they have to do, and uh, so I'm quite confident uh, on what they are doing. I, I also feel that there is a difference when we're doing force duction testing, and I apply this. One thing is doing the force duction test in the office in a patient that is awake, and one, a different one is doing the force duction test in a patient that is completely paralyzed. If you still have restriction in such a situation, that muscle needs to be weakened. The difference will be a muscle that maybe has a high tonus, that you have the patient that is awake, but you cannot have the muscle completely relaxed. And on those cases, probably you're gonna have a force duction test that went from positive in the office to maybe negative, and just perhaps being tight just at the very end of the ocular rotation. Um, but I never have asked the anesthesiologist to relax more or less um, when I'm performing the force duction testing. Uh, uh, one David. more point I just wanted to make is that in addition to doing a force duction test, when finally I end hooking the muscle, you can actually also feel the tightness in the muscle. So in addition to the force duction test, which may change according to the anesthesia level, when you hook a muscle and you feel the yes, you try to move it and you'll see, yes, I do feel the tightness. That's also one way to tell you that, yes, you have to go ahead and release the tightness. On it. That's a and great when I, when, I, when I teach a force duction test, I always tell my, my fellows, they have to perform force duction tests in every patient, not only on reoperations, because they have to know what is normal. If yes. they don't know what is normal movement, they won't know if it is a, uh, there is a restriction. That's why I mentioned the magic number 30. Sorry, I'm which means, yeah, you have to do it in normal patients to really understand what you mean by a muscle tightness, which is normal. Only then you can differentiate it what is abnormal. And sometimes it's also wise to, uh, uh, at least in the United States, we need to consent, at least where I am, I need to consent the two eyes, not for surgery, if I'm planning to do surgery in one eye, but if I want to compare force duction testing, there's nothing better than the same patient. So if you have an eye that is tight, then you can compare with the other eye. And then you can know uh, for sure if the muscles on the other eye feel the same or not. Sometimes we have to make decisions of operating the two eyes versus one eye, just based on that difference on the intraoperative force duction testing. It's not only used to know when forces are normalized after we disinsert or resect the muscle, but it's also sometimes just to make a decision of which muscles are gonna be operated on in unilateral or bilateral surgeries. Okay. All right, we're gonna move forward. Yeah, so the other important thing is a globe traction. We can use something like this, which are the locking forceps, which take the curve, as mentioned here, to get an exposure. But then if you don't have the in instrument, you can even use a suture, which is seen. So the idea is to you know, move the globe on one side so you have a maximum exposure, so you can go about doing your surgery. Then conjunctival incision, as I mentioned, I would like the initial case, especially if you don't have the reports and you're not sure where it is in the, for the uh, residents to make in the flap, as I've shown, cut off the uh, tenons anterior to the expected insertion 
and I prefer to make pockets on either side because that's where I'm going to pass my hook to hook the muscle. Now the second case is the one which already has a conjunctival recession done. So I've taken these sutures which act like a traction. I pull them and I'm using the same to make the incision. So this is, can you know avoid and can have this flap so they can suture back in the proper position. Again, you need to make a direct cutting with the scissors because blunt dissection is not enough. And the same for sutures can be used to reconstruct your conjunctiva. So I just want to make a very short video um, just to, just to um, show you something that I believe is important. Most of the time we're definitely doing limbal or paralimbal incisions as is being said. But there are going to be times when you're going to find out, especially in patients that have previous other surgeries or even uh, adjustable suture that the conjunctiva is very posterior. And if you find something like that, you have to be aware of where you're going to put that conjunctiva after you're done with the surgery because you can create a significant restriction just by advancing the conjunctiva. So just keep that landmark because it's sometimes difficult to know where it was before the surgery. So coming to the important point, muscle isolation, after you've taken the conjunctival flap, you will notice that one side is free. At the other side, there is significant adherence. So I'm using the blunt dissection with the scissors Constantly getting my conjunctiva over to ensure that I don't cause a buttonhole and trying to make in a flap. I use a small hook to try to hook the muscle at one edge so that the hook can then be passed easily. Remember here, we cannot get a pole test done because there'll be significant additions. Once the hook is placed and you'll see it coming through the other edge, you know that most of the muscle is then hooked. This can be followed by direct incisions made. Try to get a plane which is between your muscle and the conjunctiva. And you see that you're only cutting tenons at each level. Your muscle is hooked, so you are a little secure. But as you go to the area where it's adherent, constantly keep looking that you're not causing any buttonholing. And in this case, you'll see a small buttonhole that happened. But then again, so try to go closer to your sclera, but ensure to maintain a plane between your muscle and the sclera. The next video, can you play it again? No, no, going back, just give me one. So next case on the right hand side is a patient who had undergone surgery for modified Anderson. So the muscle was way behind. So again, I'm making two pockets on either side of my conjunctiva to be able to hook. Can you see how tight it is? And remember when you measure for muscles which are significantly recessed, it's best to use this scleral ruler because it takes the curve of the globe so you can actually measure the distance where, where it is and then accordingly place it beyond. Well, uh, we have to remember that uh, reoperation, it will bleed, bleed more than uh, when you operate a, a muscle that was not operated before. Uh, I always tell my fellows, think twice or maybe, maybe more before cutting any structure. Uh, you have to be sure what you are cutting. And remember the muscle anatomy, as you can see on the slide, the hook uh, is uh, hooking the lateral rectus and the inferior oblique. I say it will be difficult, but you can make it easier. Uh, you have to operate slowly and taking care. So identifying all the structures, intermuscular membrane, muscles, scar tissues, and remember the anatomy. And one important tip is uh, uh, my professor, Carlos Osadia, learned from Arthur Jampolsky, and uh, Federico's uh, mentor, Arthur Rosenbaum, also uh, learned from Arthur Jampolsky. When you uh, hook the muscle and you insert the scissor, you can penetrate, uh, hook the, the muscle through the, the tun tunnel of the scissor. And uh, we will uh, show this. Uh, video from Arjun Polsky that gave me more than 30 years ago just to show how he, he performed this uh, maneuver. In re or in lost muscle, one wants to first prepare the conjunctiva for closing. So you undermine it well, thin it as far as possible while it's intact. A lot easier to do now than later. He's preparing the conjunctiva to make it thinner and you will see his opening uh, back with the scissor, and now on the tunnel, he will insert the, the hook. 
this is a very nice tip and important that makes surgery easier. So this is a historical video that uh, Art gave me. And it was interesting because uh, Federica and I, was, we were both showing the same uh, tip. So I'm going to go back to this um, maneuver that we all learned. Ooh, something happened. Wait. Uh, something, give me a second. Something happened. My, my, uh, my, my PowerPoint presentation just closed. Mauro, do, right, well, do you have Federico, you have well, yeah. it? I'm ready. Why you guys get that up? I can, I can open it. Oh, just open it. We work. Okay, it's open on my side again. Oh, no, just guys, you open one of you. Okay, let me go to it. I don't know what happened. <laughs> Thank you. We were prepared late for this. We were prepared. Thank I'm you. very impressed. You guys, you guys are fabulous, the integration that you're doing. Whoever, can, so, can you open it? Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, great. So it's going to run. Okay, so what I want to say here is simple. It's the same maneuver, but I want to emphasize, this is what I learned from Rosenbaum. Put the scissors following the curvature of the eye. But it's also important not, so, not only to release the, the muscle, but for example, between those attachments here, between the superior oblique, in the superior rectus muscle is very important. So this is a great maneuver for this. All right. Federico? Right, so two more videos. One is the importance of normalizing the forces interoperatively. But I wanna just tell you that I learned is better that you remove your eyelid speculum when you're repeating your intraoperative force adduction testing um, to repeat these um, intraoperatively because sometimes the conjunctiva is so tight that uh, even after the muscle is released, you're not gonna really know for sure if you have released completely your um, force adduction test. As you can see here, the medial is very free, but the lateral rectus, I'm sorry, the medial rectus is not tight in a reduction. So I feel that when you're doing any of these muscle suturing, it's important to have a three-point fixation, where the central part is taken a double arm, followed by interlocking partial and full thickness at the edge, because these are already operated muscles. So when you're trying to take, the last thing you want is the muscle slip. Like this is another tight muscle. I have taken a central bite twice and then interlocking. So we are assured that when you're putting the muscle back, we have it entirely in place and don't want to sag. Even in cases where you have to do a significant recession, I would advise a hangback recession, which needs to be done. And that's easier to put, as you see her, it's significantly behind. This patient, we did a hangback. I did an FDT on table, ensure that the muscle uh, contracture or the tightness was relieved and then finally closed it. The next video. Yeah, so what is important in hangback is it's very good in cases of eyes which are really long, avoid scleral perforation, and especially in retinal buckles if you want to do a large recession, but remember you should not exceed more than six millimeters because then eye muscle tends to creep and the idea purpose of achieving a hangback is lost. So remember to keep, remember to have that six millimeter in mind. So this is incidentally a video I was just collecting these things it was in 2011 where I was teaching my fellow the differentiation between a scar tissue and a muscle. As you can see, this is about 14 millimeters from the limbus where you are seeing the actual muscle fibers and that's where the actual muscle is. This is a stretch scar. So when you're taking the sutures should be taken at that point. I would take a knot at the center again to have a three uh, fixations because this is to be advanced. So we want the muscle to come up completely since you're going to now tighten it. So this uh, video here uh, represents actually a patient that has a large angle exotropy, and you can see the widening of the palpebral fissure in a deduction, depicting a muscle slippage. Uh, that maneuver with the muscle under the muscle is very helpful to demonstrate uh, that it's translucent. Uh, again, this widening in a deduction can make you feel like the muscle is not where you want it. 
Again, this maneuver helps to identify the translucent. Uh, this is just a muscle clamp. And it's just to show you, uh, after the muscle is inserted, that there's really no muscle there. This is only capsule. And the capsule is excised uh, prior to reinserting the, the muscle. This is the mark that we put where the muscle fibers are. So that's kind of what I do when I have a muscle slippage. When I operate on patients with glaucoma, my recommendation is having a glaucoma expert next to you. And one of the things that you're gonna find always present is this very thick capsule around the extraocular muscles. That capsule requires excision in order to release all the force torsion uh, restriction that you're gonna find and of course expose the extraocular muscles. And in patients who have um, retinal detachment, uh, cleaning the muscles that frequently are found in different locations uh, than it was originally um, described by the retinal surgeon is common. This capsule and these attachments under the muscles extend really posterior. And always keep in mind this. This is a common cause of limitation to downward rotation and isotropia in patients with retinal detachment is the trans uh, location or the anterior dragging of the superior oblique tendon when the buckle is passed because this transfers the superior oblique to be an antidepressor. Well, uh, when you have a patient who was re uh, had operated before, uh, always measure from the limbus to know where the muscle is. And I like this maneuver. When you have the sutures on the muscle, you move the globe to check if there is uh, any posterior adherence. And here you can also uh, insert a hook or a scissor to check if there is some adhesion between the muscle and the globe. And by the end of surgery, you can recess or resect the conjunctiva and put some steroids to avoid uh, future scars. Yeah, so before I go here, I just want to point to what you ideally said. So there is a concept of pseudo tendon, which happens in recessed muscles, where connective tissues fall between the original insertion and the new insertion. So when you act, hook that and as initial fellows and all, you may plan disinserting it, you will realize that there's an actual muscle behind. So always pass and see whether you can get the entire um, part of the sclera totally free beyond whatever you disinserted. And as I showed, actually look for the fibers of the muscles which you see. So this is the same case which I showed where I took the limbal uh, flaps. And you see how well you can deposit them. In the left hand and right hand is the case with the conjunctival recession already. Those two uh, silk for uh, sutures which are taken were deposited back and you can construct the conjunctiva back to normal. So for those of us who like to be in adjustable sutures, uh, the timing of adjustment is uh, variable, is I guess a surgeon preference. And um, I, we have uh, Dr. Granite here who can talk about late adjustment. We're gonna ask for his opinion. I personally do patients under topical anesthesia in whom I do intraoperative adjustment, but I personally don't use the intraoperative adjustment as the final adjustment because I feel like there's more than just the operating room for the patient to be looking around. Um, I do uh, adjustments in the recovery room before the patient is discharged and I do patients up to 24, 48 hours uh, because I think the patient requires some sensory adaptation before I can feel is stable. However, before we let Dr. Granin speak, I feel like if I don't patch my patients after the surgery, by the time I go to the recovery room, is one or two hours, I personally feel very confident that that alignment that I want to see is the alignment that the patient will have. So I like to see overcorrections or undercorrections depending on if I operated on a vertical or a horizontal deviation. David. Yeah, uh, thanks, Federico. Very briefly, um, we developed delayed adjustable sutures in part, I think, because I was trained by orthoptists when I started my career. I, I agree with you completely about the sensory motor adaptation. I use them intraoperatively because I have them placed, and I use my force ductions to see if I've done something that I think is way off. 
Uh, I'll close the conjunctiva, and uh, the work that Shira Rams I did shows that if you add um, HA-based viscoelastic, hyaluronic acid-based viscoelastic, um, and uh, to underneath the conjunctiva, the muscle will not um, scar down very quickly, and the patient has some time to adapt. Uh, if you think about what we do in the binocular system, and if you're asking someone who's adult, especially in a reoperation, to uh, adapt to a new deviation, it does take time. And also the muscle, especially if it's been a resection or there's been multiple uh, muscles operated on, there needs to be some time for the patient to settle down. We do look at the patient postoperatively. I just checked to see how they're doing. If they're way off in the recovery room, I might consider doing something. But also by waiting, there are many patients who I can tell you, and I've presented these at meetings, where uh, every surgeon says you have to adjust them right away day one. And I showed them how we waited, and by day seven, they're perfectly ortho without us ever touching them. About 90% of the patients, if you do this, don't need to be adjusted, and about 10% do. The problem is I never know which 10%. So by waiting a week, roughly, we get the opportunity to leave the patient alone and not patch them. If I patch them, I'm doing a, a diagnostic occlusion and preventing binocular vision. So we don't want to patch them leaving the operating room. We want them to try and see how they will do binocularly before we adjust. And in our hands, it works extremely well. David, sorry, maybe, maybe Kyle and um, Daisy could add something quickly yeah. right now. Yeah, I would like to add. Um, so what I always say after the operation is also to do some um, eye movement uh, exercises that, uh, for example, if you have like a small overcorrection after an operation, you can go do convergence exercises. And uh, so we, we normally give convergence exercises, ductions exercises, and if possible, to teach them to fuse the image if fusion is possible. So I think it's very important to say that immediately after the operation to the patient that they really have to to, um, to move their eyes, to do the exercise, to get binocular vision, if, if, if present, um, to train binocular vision, if present. And I would I, say that, I would say that um, uh, my point would be uh, towards adjust, adjustments, okay? If you're um, adjusting based on whether the patient is diplopic or not, um, we have to remember that it's going to be easier for the patient to fuse or suppress if they are in a fusion-friendly visual environment. So the operating room may not be that environment, <clears throat> excuse me, because fusion-friendly is going to be a normal illumination, not too bright, not too dim, and a fairly busy visual environment, something that simulates um, normal day-to-day -day vision. So if we're, if we're adjusting based on the presence of diplopia, um, there is the potential for being misled if you're not testing the patient for diplopia in the right visual environment. And Max, uh, Max yeah. I want to just ask Max this question because he's been working on the Delphi uh, uh, surveys of strabismus surgeons around the world. Max, we're talking about adjusting. We're talking about what we're, what we're doing in our surgery. Do we even agree on where a patient should be left postoperatively? Do we do surgeons around the world um, agree on what our targets are and what a, what a successful outcome is? No, we did not actually. We did not uh, reach consensus about that. So, if I mean, we think about that. We have surgeons from around the world that don't have consensus on where we should leave the patient postoperatively. We've heard Kyle and Daisy discuss. Um, a fusion and using, trying to use our preoperative information for planning where to leave the patient. But even so, uh, if, do you leave an intermittent exotrope, five prism doctors ET, 10 prism doctors ET, 15 prism doctors ET? If they're five XT, is it a problem? We still haven't, as a field, answered those questions. I just want to yeah. another comment, a quick comment, and it was, as we see a lot of adults that are coming for reoperations, which is a big topic we're trying to address today, 
And there is a big discrepancy between the motor alignment and the sensory alignment in those patients. That patient becomes really a, a difficult situation to manage because the patient on a free space prism or all the sensory examinations preoperatively may demonstrate diplopia with the motor alignment that we want to achieve. And I guess if we poll all the presenters here, we may have different opinions. I always feel that the patient wants the eyes to be straight before the word is straight, at least when the patient is an adult. That patient has been waiting all his life to have surgery and finally said, I was finally told that I can have surgery and I'm 80 years old and I've been living with my eyes like this for the last 60 years. So we have to be a little bit more into the situation where maybe we need to deal with that diplopia. It usually goes away. And if it doesn't, well, we're going to need to undo the surgery and maybe the patient will be unhappy again with the motor alignment. I think it's something to consider in reoperation. Federico, this, this is preoperative expectation setting may be the most important thing in all these cases uh, to understand so that the surgeon and the patient are in the same place. Um, I wrote an editorial about this in the British Medical Journal, British Journal of Ophthalmology, that um, we talked about making sure that our vision matches the patient's needs. And if their need is to be orthophoric or in appearance, then you know, we can put a contact lens on one eye perhaps, and they may be much happier that way. So uh, that's one of the other reasons I like the delay adjustable sutures. It gives me a week for the patient to see what it's like and that we can make some decisions together. But I think what you raise may be the most important issue in all of this. And that discussion often is alerted to me by my orthoptist uh, before I even walk into the room about what the patient's goals are. You want to hold? Yes, why don't we finish up? Can I make it just a quick point? I just want to say that the definition of success is very personal. And it, it's, not, it's not always up to us, and it can be age dependent. What we consider a success for a child is not necessarily to be considered a success for an adult patient. Okay, and finally, uh, why the word careful was repeated several times on this presentation on reoperations. Uh, we might face some complications. Uh, the sclera might be thin, and we can get a, a perforation. And I want to end with uh, the advice to the budding surgeons that always set realistic goals and discuss with the patients and the parents about the results of strabismus surgery. Because some conditions have good prognosis, both in alignment and in binocularity. But certain conditions with restriction, paralysis, neurological deficit may not have has good prognosis. And remember, Helvestin has stated that that needing a reoperation will have only has 30 percent chance of requiring another surgery. And if the patient refuses, then it's like a relative contraindication. And one more point to make is uh, that in case you feel you're not comfortable in handling reoperations, always choose to offer it to somebody who you know can handle these kind of situations. And Jody, I'd like to say that the, the third operation is closer to the second compared to the first to the second. Right. So we have to do it uh, the best way. Yes. And uh, we will finish uh, this presentation with this uh, uh, phrase that was on Lionel Cowell's uh, presentation when he was a, a keynote of WSPOS uh, meeting in Barcelona. Uh, reoperations, we are always learning and always improving. So uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, we try to innovate and bring the, the three speakers together in one single presentation and having the discussion between the, the, the slides. So and I thank think you. we fairly did well. Yeah, so the, this was uh, uh, more, uh, just spectacular. I mean, I'm not usually speechless, but uh, for the, the talks by Kyle and Daisy and then the three of you together, um, I found myself sitting here listening and learning and forgetting that I was helping moderate the talk because um, it was just incredible. Now, remember, we, we 
uh, titled this How to Teach for Business Reoperations. And what we went through is a discussion of principles that the, the, the new surgeon, but it turns out the teacher and the experienced surgeon can all learn from in how to plan and propose. We didn't plan to teach you what to do if someone has incompetence and left gaze. That wasn't the goal of this. We wanted to talk about the principles that you can learn when you have such master teachers uh, as we have here on this, uh, this group. Uh, it was just phenomenal. Max, do you, I have some slides and I want to go over the mentee, but before I do that, do you have any comments you want to add? You know, I want to just say thank you to all of you. You did a great job, terrific. Thank you very much. I learned a lot from you. Yeah, I, I, it was really phenomenal. And I think every person who does strabismus around the world is going to want to watch this. Uh, and everyone learning it is going to want to watch this. It doesn't matter what level you're at. That was incredible. So let me just quickly run through your mentee answers uh, so everybody knows. Uh, first question was, what part of the world are you from? We had uh, about 30% from Europe. We had about 20% uh, from North uh, and uh, South, uh, North and Central America. Uh, about 10% from South America. About 35% from Asia. The Middle East is represented uh, from everywhere. Um, and about 60% uh, of people were uh, who watched are uh, identify as female. Um, and then 80% uh, are pediatric ophthalmologists, and we have thousands and thousands of people that we're watching with you today. Um, every 55% uh, said that they do a preoperative sensory motor exam by an orthoptist, 35% do it by themselves, 10% interestingly said that they don't think it's always necessary. Prism adaptation was asked, uh, and uh, about 55% said they use PAT and intermittent uh, exotropia. Uh, and 20% in um, consecutive esotropia. Uh, when planning a strabismus reoperation, uh, ocular motor rotations and slit lamp exam were felt to be very important. Uh, and uh, imaging was uh, about 10% use imaging, where 10% also use forced ductions in the office. Um, the next question was when operating on patients with previous strabismus surgery, which is the correct course of action. Uh, and it's uh, identifying the mechanical forces uh, and uh, letting those mechanical forces lead you to where to go. Uh, this is your answers from all around the world. In preoperative, perioperative examination for a patient that needs a strib uh, strabismus operation, the most common answer, 95%, said it's important to evaluate the, the postoperative position of the eyes um, at, the begin at the end of the surgery as well as at the beginning. to have a great experience learning with uh, your fellow uh, specialists around the world. And the discussions on YouTube and, and on Facebook are spectacular. Please don't forget about um, your opportunity to um, uh, uh, sign up for Connect Still. You get these uh, for months, huge amount of information. Plus, you get a free book on intraoperative OCT and pediatric ocular surgery, a free book in addition for your learning. Um, I have to say thank you to all, to all of our guest speakers, to uh, Max Serafino, my co-moderator, thank you so much for helping planning. Our three surgeons to work together and put that to, to talk together, it was frankly spectacular and uh, uh, bravo. Uh, and to our orthoptists, it is like it always is, without you to set the table and feed us the proper information and teach us about our patients, we have nowhere to go. Uh, and so thank you again.
Thank you to NTOD for hosting and for all of your hard work to make sure this goes together. For those of you in the audience who don't know how much work is done behind the scenes, our WSPLS uh, administrative team, uh, Dara McCafferty, Emma Hester, and uh, the fabulous and wonderful uh, Akila Acharya, um, you have been spectacular again, and thank you so much for all of your help. To all of you around the world, remember, this video will be available on YouTube. So um, it is uh, early morning here and late in uh, Australia where people want to go to sleep. I thank from the bottom of my heart all of the people here who did so much work to make this spectacular. To all of you, my love, my thanks, my friendship, all of you were spectacular. And thank have you. A great bye bye. Rest of your day. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. An honor. Bye bye.